Hey, everybody. Good night. Thank you for being Good here. Night. And uh, we are excited for we are so excited <laughs> for this event, and because it's a truly honor for us. And but before we start, we were going to present ourselves. So I am Lais Mastelari. I'm a Brazilian product designer and a leader on the latest that UX Portuguese community. Andresa? Okay. Uh, hello, I am Andresa. I'm leader of the chapter, Lake Data UX chapter in Natal. Uh, and Jackie? <laughs> <laughs> hello, I'm Jacqueline, a leader, uh, leader of the uh, campaign. Uh, and book club you organized with Laiz and, and Andresa. Great. And before we start, uh, we want to um, to do a few comments and um, not rules, but anyway. <laughs> so first, we're going to sh uh, we share it on our social media a link where, for Slido where you could where girls from from the community could send us some questions. So we are going to start by these questions, okay? And But you can send uh, comments, questions about the book or questions for the author on the comments here on YouTube and we will read while you're uh, talking to her, okay? And I think the last thing is we, this meet, this meetup will take like an hour, an hour and, and um, 20. Um, I think this is it. Having something else? Nope. Just true. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so please, everybody, give a warm welcome to Ellen Lupton. Yay! Hey. <laughs> hey, Ellen. Thank you for being here with us tonight. I always love to be in Brazil. Oh. <laughs> So you already visit Brazil? Yeah, a few times. Great. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, so, Ellen, uh, we know that designers, especially graphic designers, already heard a lot about you because, you know, your books is like are like um, basic bibliography for us. But we also know that uh, our community has a lot of girls that uh, are migrating to UX right now, are starting to be in design. So can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, um, I'm Ellen Lupton and I am a graphic designer and a writer and a curator. I work for a museum in New York City where I put together exhibitions about design and also do a lot of my writing and publishing. And I also teach graphic design in uh, Baltimore, which is a city between New York and Washington, DC. And I teach uh, graduate level graphic design. So all of my work is really about celebrating what design is and inviting people to participate. You know, whether it's um, the general public coming to see a museum and recognizing that everything around you is designed <laughs> or inviting people to actually become designers. It's all it's all like one idea for me. <laughs> Participate. Oh, nice. <laughs> I can feel that like in your books and in it. And when read about you and like you can like read things, design I can <laughs> I can see it. Uh, it's so nice to have you here. I'm so excited. Uh, kind of nervous actually <laughs> to, to have you here. I was like yay. So yeah, uh, <laughs> lace. Oh yeah, and uh, I forgot. <laughs> to say that uh, we have a book club on the Brazilian community and our April's book were, was uh, Design is a Storytelling. And that's why we brought Ellen Lupton here. We loved the book. 
It's like uh, <laughs> it's it's like an art to 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 design like um, and my, uh, the first first question we got was like um, you wrote at the beginning of the book that the idea of writing about uh, storytelling was questioned ab um, by a young designer. Mm -hmm. affirming that storytelling was no sense and i remember that at the time they launched they they launched the book i i didn't heard a, a lot about storytelling design anything so what gave you the idea to mix design and storytelling together well i was actually taking some courses in creative writing because oh, cool. I've, yeah, I've always been a writer, but I really do technical writing. You know, I'm explaining yeah. X heights <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, user experience mm -hmm. principles. So I started taking some graduate courses in creative writing. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm very bad at creative writing, but I was very, very interested yeah. to learn about the structural principles mm -hmm. around storytelling, which are so interesting. And when you study any subject, whether it's basket weaving or typography or cooking, yeah. <laughs> right, you quickly learn that there is so much knowledge mm -hmm. that you can't just, you just don't walk into a room and suddenly you're a designer. You, there's so much knowledge. And so around storytelling, I learned so many things. And as I learned these things, I kept seeing the connection to graphic design. Mm -hmm. So one thing is that when writers talk about telling a story, they often use graphic models. So we talk about an arc that um, a, a story has an arc and that's a very visual idea. So a story begins in a low energy point and then the, the conflict begins, the, the hero has a goal, a mission, whether it's finding the treasure or marrying the guy or overthrowing the king, <laughs> whatever the driving action is. And the action builds and builds and builds and builds and gets higher and higher until it reaches a climax. And then the action comes down and you, you feel satisfied that the action is complete. And that is described as an arc. And we see that arc everywhere. So if you think about editing video, and the sound, the sound formation for every word and every time the sound gets louder and then quieter, that's an arc, right? Because each, each sound, you know, enters and builds and leaves. And so for a story to be satisfying, it has to have that change in energy, that rising and falling change in energy. And that's a, it's a pattern, right? And graphic designers use patterns. And another graphic pattern that storytellers use is, um, is the circle. It's called the hero's journey. And this is very famous in world literature that the hero starts out at home and the hero has a call to action she always says no, always. <laughs> but then the call comes again and she says yes. And she enters her journey. And in the journey, she has to go to a magical place, a special place, right? It's the city of Oz. It's a different planet in Star Wars. You know, <laughs> It's someplace different from home. And it's full of challenges, ordeals, battles that she has to fight. And ultimately she leaves the magic place 
and she is triumphant and she is reborn is a, very much a birth image that the hero mm -hmm. is born out of this conflict and this magic place. And the hero returns home, always comes back to the beginning. So it's this circle. So if you think about design and what we create, and especially user experience design, that we're inviting the user to enter a different space, right? The user is at home in their chair, at their desk, in their car. <laughs> And we create a threshold for them to enter our place, which could be a store or an exhibition or an app or a website or inside a book. You know, I open the book and the paper yeah. is different and the type is different. And so as designers, we create that call, right, to enter this special world. And then all the decisions that we make have to reflect this magical place, the city of Oz, right? What is your Oz? What is your <laughs> Emerald City? Okay. Well, nice. There's so many more things, but that's one. <laughs> oh, it's perfect. Perfect. And, and, and it's all the first act of the book and oh my God, <laughs> I love it very much. Um, and um, do you, oh, sorry. And about storytelling, you said that um, you did the course, right? Yeah. And what book would you recommend if I want to know more about storytelling? Um, let's see, there's a really good book about the narrative arc and it's called Storycraft. Oh, Storycraft. Mm -hmm. That's really good. There's also a really good book called <laughs> Save the Cat. And Save it's a book. Save the Cat. Uh -huh. It's a I book like about this. how to write um, screenplays for movies. Cool. And it's really fun to read because <laughs> it's about the kind of repetitive um, story structures mm -hmm. that occur in movies. So it's really fun because it tells all the movies in like three sentences. <laughs> nice. Save the cat. <laughs> we received a, a question in your comments. Uh, do you believe being an author opening up the thought of linking storytelling to design? It's a nice question. <laughs> yes, but also if you make TikTok movies, that's storytelling. So storytelling isn't just literary, it's also filmmaking. And so a lot of people now are making short movies every day or every week. And those have a a shape and an arc too. So the story doesn't have to be literary. It doesn't have to be written with words, but it still has to have that structure of rising and falling energy, rising and falling emotion, um, rising and falling intensity or speed, right? Yeah. And often in, um, you know, TikTok or Instagram movies, they take the shape of a loop. <laughs> <laughs> so the circle that you have to come back to where you started. So these structures, they come from literature, but they're much older than literature because they're really from the stories that were told around the fire and, you know, that were sung and spoken. Nice. And, and it seems obvious right now after reading the book that for me, because uh, experience, it's about stories. And it's like I, I'm going to watch a movie, I have expect, uh, an expectation. And nowadays I see that the users have a lot of expectation um, on our softwares and what we design. Mm -hmm. And they can be more picky, you know, like I don't like this app because don't give me what I want or don't have my my uh, friends in it. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so when you 
thought about right this book uh, what story what journey journey for whom who is the hero that you imagined who is the target that you imagined <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, I always think about my readers when I'm uh, working on a book. And I often think of uh, young designers and what would be interesting and useful to them. I really like my books to be tools. So they're not just about uh, gathering information. You know, they're about I principles and ideas that you can use. So like, how can you apply these patterns or ideas in your work? So um, that's what I, I think about. So mostly design, I think of designers and especially in the area of user experience because experience design is temporal. It's not like designing a poster. You really are designing a journey So one of the things I came upon writing the book is that designers are always creating a path. And that could be the path that your eye makes on a website, you know, the famous like F shapes, <laughs> you know, they do eye tracking to see where people's eyes go to. That's a path. So when I look at a, a single page of a website, Even if I never scroll, my eye is moving around. Your eye is always moving. And as designers, we're trying to attract the eye and bring the eye to the content that we want people to see. But then of course, in user experience, the, the user is never just looking. They're also making choices, they're clicking. They're um, filling out forms. They are choosing to look at, you know, get more information about that dress or that pair of shoes, <laughs> you know. And that's time. It isn't a static experience. And so user experience is, uses um, storytelling in many, many ways. And the idea of experience design really dates to the 90s where that term was first used. And it was used mostly in relation to retail like Starbucks and how you could get people to pay more money for a cup of coffee if you built a whole experience around it. You know, an, an environment, um, a performance between you and the server. Uh, sensory experience around smell and lighting and touch. And then later, the idea of experience design being digital, you know, picks up on those ideas. And, and we have to create a sensory experience just through digital um, cues. It's a uh, service design, they, they call it right now, right? this experience and being a place and how you need to treat your um, customer, your user. Uh, yeah. It's, It's very time-based. Mm -hmm. And okay. sometimes there's a, a linear script. You know, we want our user to go A, B, C, D. Yeah. And that's like watching a movie, right? Mm -hmm. When I'm watching a movie, it's just straight line. But sometimes we want the user to have a lot of choices and to kind of build their own path. And both of those situations have to be designed very consciously. Nice. Exactly. And, and especially tested because you're seeing like, ah, the user are going to A, B, C, and sometimes they're going to A, 1, B, 3, C. <laughs> yeah. And what if they get lost? Exactly. Right? How do you help them find their way back? Nice. Exactly. Um, uh, we had a question sent, I think it was Rosangela. Uh, she asked you, um, which journey do you recommend 
to help us make a more systemic design sensitive to social and environmental issues. Wow, that's that's really good. So environmentally, we have to think about the um, the product life cycle, right? So there's a whole new theory of design called circular design, another kind of loop where we have to design for what happens to the product at the end. How does it get turned back? into resources. Um, the question of racial justice and social inequity is, is really important. And there's so many ways that designers connect to that. One is through representation, um, through representing diverse uh, users and characters and customers you know, in everything that we make. And the other is, you know, representation in the workplace, which is, you know, working with a diverse group of people, which requires commitment from everybody. And then a third one is opening up the language itself of design to a broader history. You know, so much of design history is just Germany and Switzerland. <laughs> And yet there's design in Brazil and Argentina and Colombia and Poland and Spain, <laughs> you know, and China and Korea and Japan and Africa. So the opening up the vocabulary and asking, you know, where else can we find inspiration besides just Switzerland is, uh, is also really important to changing the s system of design. Okay. You have a lot of like, uh, girls super excited to, to be here showing like like love for not, not just this book but also think with pipes because most of us studied and read it at the, the college time sure. we said like yeah exactly i have the brazilian <laughs> one in a different room <laughs> so yeah going to the next question what is the biggest challenge you have noticed in the area of design in the recent recent years and what advice can you give to the new designers? Um, well, like user experience is a very interesting area. Um, and I think also I say user experience, but also UI, you know, the, which is we typically refer to as the visual side of user experience. That there's parts of design that are um, kind of uh, technical, that are the, the kind of research and planning and defining of you know a problem statement and you know what what is your brand trying to do, and, and that part is easier to learn. And the visual design part, I think, is harder to learn and requires a richer um, immersion in art, art history, um, all kinds of visual things, fashion, you know, fonts, the whole crazy world of fonts and all the richness and variety that they offer. Um, and so that visual side is a harder leap. And I think it requires a, a lot of study and a lot of practice to really master that side of it. Luckily, in, in the field of user experience in UI, UX, there's lots of work that isn't really that visual, that is more the planning side. So there's work for everybody to do, which I think is very exciting. It's it's great that you said that because um, 
I already heard people saying like uh, the important part is the UX, is this experience, is the business, and sometimes the UI is the last part we think. So it's great you saying like UI. It's super difficult to do. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. And UI kind of blending into uh, branding and content development. You know, so let's say you have a, a UI, you have a whole website for like a handmade shoe company. You know? <laughs> it's like, then you have to keep creating all the communication that that company produces to engage customers and suppliers and you know, to get publicity and all the things that a company needs in order to thrive. And that requires constant creative art direction and copywriting and little campaigns, you know, social media, all of that stuff. So that, that visual, it's not just visual, it's like creative, that creative content production is ongoing for any company or organization, a museum, for example. Museums are constantly, every week, new programs and exhibitions and field trips, <laughs> you know, all this stuff. And all of it is creative. Right. You talk about um, copywriting, right? And we have mm -hmm. a question from, a question, uh, from Tatiana. Mm -hmm. Can you pin for us, Andresa? Uh That I think has everything to do with. So, Ellen, do you think UX writing is a type of design or design of the words and why? I, I do. I think that graphic design and writing are very closely connected. And that in UX and UI, just, you know, getting the language right. You know, if you're, if you're creating a menu, for example, and you want all the elements to be verbs, but there's one word that just wants to be a noun, <laughs> right? You're just, you want everything to be active, but there's this one inert noun sitting there. That's a writing challenge that directly affects design because of the length of the words, you know? And if you, if you suddenly have a menu item that's five words and it doesn't fit. And then there's the um, copywriting related more to content elements, right? Like blog posts or, um, you know, FAQ pages, all that kind of stuff that has to reflect the brand identity of the company. So they're, they're very closely connected. And I have to say that all the designers that I get excited about and admire are good writers. Something like Paula Scher and Jessica Hish and Stefan Sagmeister and Ale Paul. And um, they're all verbally gifted because you know typography and communication they go together yeah and um a question um of mine it's like do you think ux writers should not, should understand and know about uh typography also because i they can absolutely yeah because uh many ux writers that i know come from journalism and other mm -hmm. areas and Typography is so graphic design subject, you know, do you think? Yeah, but the way journalism is taught now is that journalists have to be able to produce their whole story. You know, they have to be able to upload to a co content management system and create the captions and create the headline and pick the photographs. <laughs> Sometimes they shoot the photographs edit little video clips, you know, journalists have increasingly become very media literate and typography naturally and information design, all of that stuff really meshes in with journalism today. 
So it benefits designers to know how to write because <laughs> we, we don't want to just be waiting for the copywriter to improve the, you know, interface words. But the writers Absolutely. need to know about typography too. Okay. <laughs> so continues. Okay. Um, you are used to writing about different topics like typography, storytelling, Bauhaus. Can you tell us what are you working on? There is more book coming up. <laughs> oh yeah. So this is my latest book. It just came out uh, last week. It's called Extra Bold, a feminist, inclusive, anti-racist, non-binary field guide for graphic designers. And it's really visual. <laughs> it's really fun. Um, you know, it's just full of like really cool stuff. So that just came out and I've learned so much reading about and writing about inclusive design and collaborating with designers with different backgrounds and different abilities has been super interesting to me. So that's really um, big. And so now I'm working on the third edition of Thinking with Type. And having just finished Extra Bold, now I look at this, which was published in 2010. There's one woman type designer in this whole book. There's not a oh. single type designer from Latin America. Not one. So that's really bad. <laughs> so I'm redoing this book and making the book more inclusive. That's, uh, and uh, we already uh, saw Extra Bold and we are expecting um, the translation in Portuguese. I hope so. Our yeah. Book club. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. We are super excited. And, and I think it's, um, at least in Brazil, we have this um, uh, worry about social problems yeah. and communities. We have a community, um, UX community for black people and you late that UX, of course, that brings mm -hmm. women together. And it's a um, um, hot topic nowadays, right? In design and UX. Yeah, I mean, your country, just like my country, is racially mm -hmm. divided, uh, founded by colonialists, yeah. a, a history of slavery and violence against indigenous people and violence against the um, the nature, the landscape. And so these are terrible legacies and design, you know, I always just thought, well, design doesn't really have anything to do with that. But because design reinforces this dominant, you know, European language, it does have something to do with it. It reflects and reinforces um, these patterns that are very dangerous in society. Yeah, and now that you said I'm shameful because I don't know any Brazilian typographer. So if you someone know in the comments, please. <laughs> oh my God, that's so, oh my I'm God. I'm sure there shameful. are, I know more um, <laughs> Colombia, Argentina, uh, Mexico, but of course there are typographers in Brazil and uh, yeah. you can help me find them too. We will, we will, because I, I'm going to search for them. <laughs> so continuing here to the next topic is, oh, what do you think will be the next trend in design? Um, so I was just reading, um, you know, Monotype has a good uh, newsletter email that they send about fonts. My friend Charlie Nix curates it, it's very good. And this morning he said, um, People want fonts they can touch, <laughs> which is so cool. So soft, soft edges, loopy, blobby, chewy, stretchy, 
less sharp, less abstract. Um, so I bought a typeface this morning called Peachy, <laughs> designed by a woman. And it has these like uh, soft, blobby shapes, kind of like the 70s, you know. It's very nice. So I think that's an important trend. And I think it shows the influence of, of women in design, this desire for this softer edge, you know? Yeah. Yeah, then you say visually to be less uh, hard and more soft. Okay. Uh, it's, it's like, like, the like logo our logo. For, yeah. For logo. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right? Which is very nice with the monoline. It feels very clean and modern, but it has this script and these rounded edges that's very nice, that softens it up. We have a question here on the comments from Teresa. You are certainly inspire woman. What tips would you give to the ladies who want to become a storytelling expert? expert? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, read my book <laughs> and I'll send you a link to the Portuguese PDF to share with just the ladies. Um, um, so storytelling, um, it just has so many aspects. So when we do pitches for products, we're telling a story right, or pitches for a design uh, strategy or design idea, right? Every pitch is a, um, is a performance and every pitch has a beginning, middle and end and it has a rising and falling action. And we want to engage people's emotions. So a story is not only an action, but it's an action that has some kind of emotional importance to it. And so making sure that when you talk about your work and pitch your work, you are getting the, um, the client or the audience or your colleagues <laughs> to be excited and to have a sense of suspense and, you know, revelation Right, you don't put all three ideas on the screen at once. You like, each one is a gift, right? And you have to reveal the gift. Um, so that's part of storytelling is really just the way you interact with the world. And then in your work, you know, the element of, um, of sensory uh, interest, you know, we just talked about things getting soft, right? So if, if I say the design is soft, that is a sensory reference, uh, even though really it's just pixels on the screen. Well, what if I also want it to smell good? How do you do that on the screen? <laughs> and that might be through the uh, certain kinds of colors that you choose and put together, right? Um, that reminds you of the forest or of a bakery or a candy shop. Um, yeah, so it's everywhere, the stories. Amazing. And we also have a question uh, from Joyce. Uh, can you click? It's, hey, Ellen, what do you think about a project with Paula Scher? I think it's that. <laughs> You're a great female uh, design reference for us in Brazil. You are awesome. <laughs> oh, that's so, nice. You're awesome too, Joyce. I love Paula Scher. She's a great storyteller. <laughs> so one thing... You know, that like even when you are creating a poster or a logo, which is like a single image, right? It's a flat thing. The way you design it can imply movement and change. And I think Paula does that really beautifully in her work. 
So her posters, you know, show somebody yelling or jumping or falling. <laughs> and that creates action, right? Rather than showing somebody asleep, right? <laughs> Passive. <laughs> and then the way she puts typography together, like her logo for the public theater, it's all these different weights of type. It's like already animated right by having these different parts together i think anytime we uh have things overlap right that suggests motion and change <laughs> instead of things just being apart right they're touching they're overlapping they're connecting and she's brilliant at all of that um changing the scale of something, right? That she wrote a book called Make It Bigger. <laughs> yes, it's all. Right, all that's realistic. a verb, it's an action <laughs> of things being big and catching your attention. Uh, what else we have? Uh, Teresa has another question. Oh, Sibeli, design is, is design mm -hmm. political? <laughs> I think it's always political, even when it doesn't seem like it. And so design is political because the client has a politics. Design is political because of how it chooses to represent the world, right? Who's included, who's excluded. Um, design is political because as part of an economic transaction, you know, often, and we can create design outside of that, like creating political posters for the street, but most design is part of an economic um, system, which is inherently political. Um, also, Teresa, uh, do you believe that design can, ah, it's together with that, can change the world? for the better? I think it can. I think it can also change the world for the worst, you know, that we designers contribute as much to um, waste and environmental disaster and social inequity as we do to um, addressing those things. So that requires consciousness to avoid the harm and enhance the good. And now we have ah, two questions that I think are connected is which advice would you give women to become more courageous and put their projects into practice? Mm -hmm. And the, ah, the other one, ah, Yes, later, <laughs> please. Okay. Go ahead. So I think a really great way to <clears throat> increase your own courage is to affirm other people and to be aware when you're in a room where the women are being ignored or talked over <clears throat> to draw attention to, to the other women and this actually has a name, it's called amplification. So if Teresa is in a meeting and she brings up an idea and I like the meet, I like her idea. If I say Teresa's idea suggests X, just me saying her name increases her status in the room it assigns her agency to that idea, just saying her name. And I think if, if we can get in the habit of doing that for other women and other people who are marginalized in the room who aren't being seen or heard, that ultimately we will build our own power too. But it, it kind of starts with sharing and being aware of 
these patterns, which are often not deliberate. It's like, if there's a couple of people dominating, they might not even know it. That's just, it's just the way they are. <laughs> and, and often the people who dominate grew up being told that they were the ones in power. They were the ones with, um, with money. They were the ones to get picked on the sports team. They were the ones with extra lessons and training. <laughs> they were the ones to always be asked to do things. And if we weren't that person and we were expected to be quiet and in the background, it's hard to change that role. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and the other one that I want to connect with this was, um, who are the women who influenced you in design from Sibeli? Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so many women. Um, there were incredible women in the Bauhaus, like Ani Albers and Friedel Dicker. Um, there are women who are from uh, my generation, but who were more leaders than me, like Lorraine Wilde and Louise Feely and um, women who are slightly older than me, like Paula Scher, who was you know, already famous when I was in school, even though she's not that much older than me, but she, her career started so early. So she was already like a big figure when I was just entering the field. There are so many women, um, Susanna Lichko, the amazing typeface designer. Um, yeah. And uh, Viviani sa um, sent us a question. Does a good storytelling help to build a more assertive, non-violent communication? Well, it can. I mean, storytelling, um, you know, many of the world's most famous stories are very violent, like the Bible, for example. <laughs> um, so storytelling, because it thrives on conflict, has an innate uh, discomfort to it. Like stories intrigue us because the hero doesn't instantly get what they want. There's no story if they get it right away. You know, so it's a little bit different what we do because we want to deliver these simple experiences to people. Um, but with reference to the idea of violence, like one thing to do is to question your own language. So for example, I was doing a, a type a workshop and I called it boot camp. And I thought, why am I using the word boot camp? That comes from the military. And so many words that we use like shooting a photograph. <laughs> Right, are actually very military words. So I changed the workshop to type spa. And the idea that we would get together and do typography together and it would be a form of self care and it would be um, nonviolent and pleasurable. But, but like a yoga class, Parts of it will hurt, right? Parts of it, you have to push yourself yet farther than your normal comfort zone in order to really achieve the effect of yoga. And so a type spa, you should be like stretching, but it doesn't have to be violent. It doesn't have to be military. Uh, it, you said um, about boot camp it was great because we use boot camp here in Brazil and it's Everywhere. worse because it's like we don't even know the origin of the word <laughs> and we yeah, it's where you send soldiers to learn how to be soldiers and it's very violent it's very abusive so why do we yeah. have that language why should we 
Embrace that. No. Type I didn't know until now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> type spy, it's so much better. Oh my God. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, Andresa, do you want to, to take the another? Um, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. There is more. Uh, okay. I was looking here <laughs> in the comments. Do you believe that we can use storytelling to engage the de development team with the design project being created? Good question. Nice. Well, I think a lot of the standard tools of user experience um, use storytelling, like journey maps um, and development teams, I assume, are, you know, part, part of that. Look at that. Um, they can, these journey maps can become very complex, you know, very detailed. Um, but also to engage the development team and the sort of bigger story of a brand and what you want people to experience, right? What, how you want them to feel. So, to me, storytelling is what do you want people to feel? And what do you want them to do? And the doing is often the interaction, you know, push the button, buy the product, sign up for the newsletter, um, leave a review, you know, those are doing. And the feeling is like, how, what's their vision of this experience? How do they remember it? How do they, um, what do they associate it with? I was just looking at the MailChimp website, you know, for designing newsletters. And it's so fun. It's so joyous. Yes. And it's very, and everything about the UX and everything about the writing and the chewy, bloppy, sweet typeface, everything about it. And they have a character, right? Yes, the character. Yeah, interacts with you. It's great. Yeah, because stories have characters, and and their brand, the name of it is Mailchimp. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. It's like your little buddy. That was very successful UX design. And Teresa sent us another question, and that one. Uh, it's a question that I have too. It's what was the biggest challenge to become a uh, became an author, write, and publish a book? The challenge is finishing, getting started and finishing. I talk to so many people who want advice about how to write a book, and they have great ideas, titles, and uh, you know, sample content and everything. But very few of them actually do it because it takes day after day. You have to stay committed to it, usually with having several other jobs. Like I am a museum curator. I teach college. I have dogs. I have children. They're grown up, but, you know, <laughs> for a long time, yeah. little children and writing a book is very challenging. So you just, you have to stay with it, almost like going to the gym, which I don't do. <laughs> but, you know, people go to the gym for a week and they're all excited and then they quit. And writing a book is like that. You have to keep at it. And really a book, you just write it, you know, every, it's just one page at a time. Again, like going to the gym. <laughs> You just have to keep doing it, and then eventually you'll be finished. And you told you, uh, you said, oh, d before that, please, it's it's one that I have because um, Ellen um, said that you are a curator of a design museum, right? Uh -huh. And I never went to a design museum. I don't know what happens in a design museum. <laughs> what can we see? When we enter the design uh, museum. <laughs> well, we show fashion, furniture, typography, um, 
interaction design. We, you know, instead of showing paintings and sculptures, we show what designers create. And yeah, because it seems to me that it's a lot of uh, subjects and things that you could oh, it's show. it's huge, yeah, it's huge. Because you have the whole history and you have, you know, contemporary kind of future oriented things and digital design. So it's huge. It's just you, you, it's focused on applied art on functional objects as opposed to art. So when you come to New York, come, come to Cooper Hewitt. But yes. many museums in New York exhibit design. So MoMA has design exhibitions. The Museum of Arts and Design is all craft and design. Um, we have many design galleries and experiences in New York. Oh, I need to visit because yes. I got really curious about. <laughs> Take me with you. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, First, we need to get vac vaccinated and then we go. <laughs> I hope that's happening in Brazil. You have yeah, vaccine yet? No, but we will. We have faith. <laughs> oh. Yeah. But uh, uh, let's, yeah, to next, uh, Teresa, what's, what were the coolest things that happened to you <laughs> after you became an, an author? Well, the best thing is meeting people who've actually read the books or interacted with them. I don't expect anybody to read an entire book. And I write my book so that you can open it anywhere and find things in the book. It's not like A to B, it's, you know, nonlinear. But when I meet somebody who has read a, one of my books, it's usually thinking with type. <laughs> That's the most popular one. That's the best thing, you know? And then it's really fun to see the book in an actual bookstore. But you know the, these are rare now, so mo mostly people buy them online. I want to say that we read start uh, design uh, storytelling's design from the beginning to the end. It's awesome. Aww, it's Aww, nice. We love it so much. <laughs> it's amazing. It's a catch because you can you cannot stop to read it, and it's like easy to read it, like easy. Aww, that's great. Uh, I don't know the word now, but it's. Good. It's like we're going evolving, and it's like I, I'm kind of tired, but oh no, the the other page is a huge image, and it's beautiful and it's entertaining, <laughs> and then you go and go and, and you finish the book. <laughs> Be involved, oh, I'm so involved. That's great. Um, do we have any more questions? Um, yeah. Do you have an a uh, from Yudi, do you have a tip to stay folks and organize it while juggling a lot of responsibilities? Mm, that's a good one. I need to. <laughs> yeah, so I, what I found, and it's been exciting and working at home for the last year, a, a positive, is how much you can get done in a short amount of time. So like I've gotten into like, how much can I do in the 10 minutes before a Zoom call? Or even tonight, we got on the call at 5.30 and then I turned my camera off for 15 minutes and I read like two articles about <laughs> typography. And, you know, so if you think about, it, it can be so overwhelming, all the stuff that we have to do. I think especially women especially if you have children at home, it's just very overwhelming. Um, but if you can sort of look at even 15 minutes or 20 minutes, there's a lot you can do. And if we wait until we have a whole hour or a whole day to do something, that's very discouraging. Whoa. <laughs> but then I'm trying so to focus on the thing like today I was at a faculty meeting and I had that the Zoom window open, but I was also doing other things. 
And this was very distressing. It made me tired and anxious. And I wish I had just either not attended the meeting or not, not distracted myself with doing these other little tasks. You know, so give, give things some focus, and, and, but you don't need a whole lot of time. You just need to focus on it. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Viviani, design will never be the same after this pandemic scenario? Probably not. I mean, nothing's ever going to be the same. And things will, you know, new things are being designed, like new ways to work and new ways that restaurants exist and new ways that people shop and acquire products and groceries and food and new ways that healthcare is delivered. And so, some of those things will go, will continue, right? And some of them will, will not, you know. Great. Uh, so we have one more from Teresa, Teresa and one more from us. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what advice would you give to a young gal in Lipton? Just love yourself. You know, I just, <laughs> all older women say this, but it's like, if I could look That's like true. that now, <laughs> you know, but I was so like, oh, I hate my ass and I hate my face. <laughs> you know, I'm not good enough. I'm not pretty enough. <sighs> just be kind. You know, give yourself love. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. And in on each uh, meeting that we do in on the book club, we say always uh, what we are reading re uh, reading now. So oh, yeah. Ellen, <laughs> what book are you uh, are you reading now? I'm reading this really interesting book called let me get it in the picture right. Yeah, you're seeing. De Deconstruction in Chinese. Wow. What is it about? Um, it's really cool. Okay, now you can really see it. It's about how in Chinese um, art, there is a tradition of copying and that there's a different sense of what it means to be original and what it means to be an artist and a different sense of time. And I think it's very interesting for someone with a Western artistic education and a Western view of originality to, to read this, um, this book, which is really written for Westerner, Westerners to like change their consciousness. So it's, it's very nice for me to read because I do feel like it's, it's directed at changing my point of view. Great. Yeah. Um, Andresa, do you want to say something? Amazing. Yeah. Just then, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's so different, right? I, I didn't know the, the book. Great. So, um, girls, that was it. That was Ellen Lupton here with us tonight. Thank you, Ellen, so much for your presence. And I think this is it. I <laughs> loved it. Thank you. Hey. Thanks for Great. having me in Brazil. Yeah. <laughs> I really so. enjoyed it. Great. Uh, and for the Brazilians that are here, this live, it's going to go to the Late Study Wax in Portuguese channel in soon not now, but soon, translated to Portuguese also. So then more people Great. can enjoy it too. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. This is it. Uh, yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Okay.